one-dimensional structures in electromagnetics. This is a topic that confuses many people. I will start by saying no matter what it is we're simulating, we are always doing something that is representing something that is physically three dimensions. It's just that sometimes numerically, we can reduce this down so that we only have one dimension where things are changing. Now, one dimensional problems really reduces to what we're showing here. It's infinite layers of dielectric slabs. And by infinite, they're infinite in the X and Y direction. They are not infinite in the Z direction. The Z direction is the one that we're actually performing the simulation. But the slabs themselves and the waves go off to infinity in the X and the Y directions. Even though the waves cannot be directed along the Z axis, all that's happening to them in the X and Y directions is that they accumulate phase. Their amplitude or anything else is not changing. That lets us handle the waves in the X and Y directions analytically. We don't have to handle that numerically. In this problem, the Z direction is the only numerical direction. So one dimensional simulations, we're simulating slabs, infinite slabs of dielectric. And it's very, very fast and efficient to simulate these things this way if you can. And it's a big mistake I see a lot of people do. They jump right into the big, bad, ugly three-dimensional problem and they get bogged down there. Whereas many times, even if you're simulating weird looking antennas and stuff, very often we can reduce that down to one dimension, sometimes two-dimensional simulations that run a whole lot faster than two-dimensional simulations and we can get 90% of our work done there before finally moving into three dimensions. And with our design almost finished, we have many, many, many fewer slow simulations in 3D. So this is what is meant by one dimensional simulation. Make no mistake, we are always simulating physically three dimensional things. Let's look at some examples of how three-dimensional problems can be reduced to one dimension. A real obvious one, if you're an optics person, is thin film optical filters. We'll take a substrate, we'll grow alternating layers of different materials on top of that. Typically, these film thicknesses are on the order of a half wavelength or so. And when we illuminate it with broadband light, it will reflect or transmit certain bands. Well, as long as we're willing to ignore what's happening at the edges, where of course there would be scattering and diffraction and, and things that can't be handled in one dimension, very often we only use this in the middle. So if we can ignore the edges and we only care about what happens in the middle, this becomes a one-dimensional simulation. Even if those waves are off axis, the stack of layers itself is in one dimension and numerically, we can handle this with a one-dimensional code. Now we're looking at a rather complicated device. It actually has structure in the X and Y direction, which you're seeing right now. If those structures is much less than a wavelength, it turns out the wave will see essentially just an average of the material properties in each of those layers. That lets us take an average and replace it with a homogeneous medium which has that average and simulate this in one dimension. So this is very, very fast and efficient and I think very good practice before moving on to the three-dimensional simulations. And other than just averaging, there's a bit better and more sophisticated ways of figuring out what those averages are using effective index theory, effective medium theory, and we'll actually get into that in the next example. So here is a three-dimensional microstrip circuit. And each layer, if you will, in this microstrip circuit has a microstrip of some width, so it has some impedance and some propagation constant. And of course, there's fields fringing outside of this, so it's a very three-dimensional problem. But if we just look at this as each section of this transmission line circuit as having a different impedance and different propagation constant, we can convert that into a one dimensional simulation of infinite slabs where each slab has an impedance and a refractive index, which of course we can then turn into 
or mu and epsilon in each layer. And we can simulate circuits like this very accurately with a very, very fast code. And we've done this in our research and it works extremely well. Here's another example that comes from optics. Here's an integrated optical waveguide, which has some interesting structure to it. And so what we can do is we can look at cross sections of that waveguide, analyze those as two dimensional problems, figure out what mode propagates in that section and figure out its effective refractive index. Given those effective refractive indices, we can perform a one dimensional simulation, which would be our effective medium model and get a very accurate representation of what would happen in this three dimensional problem. But our simulation here takes microseconds instead of maybe minutes to hours to perform. And it's always good practice to do this if you can. And I think this is a, a huge shortcoming of commercial software that can't do these reduced order simulations. By that, I mean one dimension and two dimensional simulations. And it forces us to get very lazy and not think about how to reduce three dimensional problems to 1D and 2D, if only for just some preliminary simulations to get us closer to that final simulation in 3D. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.